Back in 1987, a record company asked one of my mentors, Lauren Mazel, if he thought it might be possible to reduce the 15 hours of music in Richard Wagner's sprawling four opera ring cycle to the length of a single CD, and if it could be performed by an orchestra alone, completely eliminating the vocal parts. Mazel accepted the challenge because, as he said, the orchestral score itself is the ring, encrypted in a musical code. Mazel wanted audiences to decrypt this code through the symphonic synthesis he created, which he called, appropriately enough, the ring without words. As he assembled his piece, he imposed a couple very strict parameters. It had to unfold chronologically, working its way from the opening bass note of the Rheingold to the final chord of the Twilight of the Gods. And every note had to be by Wagner himself. No newly composed transitional passages allowed. So what is this musical code Mazel was hoping to help audiences decrypt? Well, to tell his story, Wagner used what we call leitmotifs, which are short, constantly recurring musical phrases played by the orchestra, each associated with a particular person, place, or idea. Wagner takes these leitmotifs, interweaves them, and evolves them to show us what's really happening as the story of the ring progresses. On the first half of this evening's program, we'd like to show you how. The first opera, The Rheingold, tells the story of the theft of the gold protected by the maidens in the Rhine River and the creation of the all-powerful ring made from that stolen gold. We begin, as Wagner says, in greenish twilight at the bottom of the Rhine with the zen-like, almost minimalist motif of the Rhine itself, which is nothing more than a simple ascending E-flat major chord. It's introduced by the horns entering one at a time, first playing the motif every four bars, then every two, then every bar, then every beat, to depict the motion of the Rhine River, the cradle of the entire ring cycle. And so it goes for 136 bars, five glorious minutes, Wagner painting for us in tones alone the Rhine. In scene two, we find ourselves in an open space on mountain heights. The chief of the gods, Wotan, awakens on the mountaintop and sees the gods' new home, a magnificent castle called Valhalla. Now, the motif for Valhalla sounds exactly how you'd think a theme for the gods would sound, regal, noble, and stately. But there's a special twist, and that's a brand new instrument that Wagner adds to the orchestra, known appropriately enough as a Wagner tuba. Now, this is a hybrid instrument invented specifically for the ring cycle that's a cross between a horn, and a trombone. And Wagner uses four of them in the ring. This is how they sound playing the God's noble Valhalla theme.
God's majestic music eventually picks up steam as Wotan descends into Nibelheim, the home of the dwarves for the opera's third scene. Now, the Nibelungs are blacksmiths, so they're represented by a kind of hammering rhythm, with Wagner even including a passage for 18 offstage anvils to depict the dwarves as they toil away. By the fourth and final scene of the Rheingold, we've left the home of the dwarves and have ascended back to the mountaintop, where at last the gods prepare to enter Valhalla. But before they do, Donner, the god of thunder, played in our version by a trombone, summons a storm to clear the air. You can almost hear the mists gathering in the strings. As that music builds to a climax, our tour through the Rheingold ends and a terrifying hammer blow, symbolizing a bolt of lightning, ushers in the second opera, The Valkyrie. In Norse myth, which is what Wagner based the ring on, the Valkyries were women who chose who died in battle and who lived to fight another day. Now, the Valkyrie in Wagner's title is Brunhilde, daughter of Wotan. And this second opera is about the journey she goes on to meet the ultimate hero of our saga. But we begin by meeting the hero's parents, and here's how. The Valkyrie opens with a raging storm, and a new character, Sigmund, seeks shelter from the downpour at the home of Sieglinde. Well, it eventually becomes clear that not only are Sigmund and Sieglinde not strangers, they're actually long-lost twins and children of no less than Wotan himself. In spite of being brother and sister, Sigmund and Sieglinde, of course, fall instantly in love. <laughs> it's Wagner, you know. So here's a little bit of their love music written for the romantic string section in all its glory. Hard to imagine any of those classic golden age of Hollywood film scores without Richard Wagner. After we hear music depicting Wotan's rage and the ever-popular 
Ride of the Valkyries, we jump to the almost indescribably beautiful music that accompanies Wotan's emotional farewell to his daughter, Brunhilde, at the end of the opera. A quick word on what's transpired in between. Brunhilde has disobeyed her father, so he strips her of her Valkyrie status, makes her into a mortal woman, and sentences her to be held in a magic sleep on a mountaintop, pray to any man who happens by. She begs for mercy, and Wotan finally agrees to her last request, to encircle the mountaintop with magic flame to keep away all but the bravest of heroes. Though we won't meet him in the flesh until the third opera, as Wotan's farewell begins, we hear for the first time the leitmotif of this bravest of heroes, Siegfried, son of Siegmund and Sieglinde, and grandson of Wotan himself. And because of his central role in the saga, Siegfried actually has two principal leitmotifs, one primarily in minor, the other primarily in major. In Wotan's farewell, we hear the minor theme in the brass. Here in the woodwinds, the beautiful leitmotif of Wotan's love for his children, Siegmund and Sieglinde, aka Siegfried's parents. As Wotan finally lays Brunhilde down on a rock on the mountaintop and kisses her eyes closed into an enchanted sleep, we hear the leitmotif known as Brunhilde's slumber, which sinks through the orchestra as she drifts into a deep sleep. Let's hear now a good chunk of Wotan's farewell to see how brilliantly Wagner combines these themes to tell his story. I'll show you the motifs as we go. We start with Siegfried's theme. Wotan's love for Siegmund and Sieglinde.
to slumber. the Valkyrie introduced us to Brunhilde, the third opera of the cycle introduces us to our hero, Siegfried. By the time we meet him, Siegfried is a young man being raised by the dwarf Mima, and Mazel starts his excerpts from Siegfried with music depicting Mima's nightmare about the ferocious dragon Fafner. Now, this goes directly into some very heroic music as Siegfried forges the magic sword that will ultimately kill the dragon. After the climax of this forging song, Siegfried goes into the forest to face the dragon. And while he waits for Fafner to emerge from his cave, Siegfried stretches out under a tree and becomes enchanted by the forest murmurs, listening with great interest to the song of a bird in the branches above him. Don't we have great birdies? <laughs> Just as Siegfried is nodding off, out comes Fafner, and the showdown begins with Wagner delivering one of the great musical battles of all time. Since there's a conflict on stage between two characters, Wagner creates musical conflict in the score between two themes. Now, the first represents our hero, Siegfried. This is the second of his two themes I mentioned a moment ago. The first motif was epic and in minor, while this one is heroic, bright, and in a major key. <laughs> and the second main theme of this musical conflict belongs, of course, to the dragon. Now, as opposed to Siegfried's theme, Fafner's theme is dark, in a minor key and is played by the low winds and brass who growl and snarl their way through the entire battle. Now, listen to how Wagner combines these two themes, alternating back and forth between Siegfried the hero with bright major key brass fanfares and Fafner the villain with dark minor key growling low in the orchestra, all culminating with a great cymbal crash when Siegfried stabs the dragon in the heart. We begin with Siegfried's theme. Dragon! Siegfried! Dragon!
that's how you score an action sequence. <laughs> After slaying Fafner, Siegfried finally makes his way to Brunhilde's rock, passes through the Ring of Fire, and awakens her from her magical slumber with a kiss. And thus ends the third chapter of the saga, and so we've come to the fourth and final opera, The Twilight of the Gods. And to give you some idea of how much great music is in this piece, Mazel selected more music for The Ring Without Words from this final opera than all three of the other operas combined. Now, this closing chapter of The Ring Cycle focuses on a handful of primary storylines. The death of our hero Siegfried, the sacrifice of Brunhilde, the return of the Rheingold to its rightful owners, the Rhine Maidens, and the downfall of the gods. After a couple long tentative lines from the cello section depicting daybreak at the beginning of the opera, we get an extended scene for our two main characters, Brunhilde and Siegfried. We've heard Siegfried's two themes already, but let's hear Brunhilde's theme, which is played here by the clarinets. Brunhilde's theme is always really easy to recognize because it has a distinctive little four-note turn after its first note. Since this is a happy moment between the two lovers, Wagner uses Siegfried's major theme, which you'll recognize from the battle with the dragon we just played. Here it is again in the horn. But Siegfried's major theme isn't always played quickly like that. Sometimes it's presented much more broadly and triumphantly. Same notes, but a completely different character. Now, that broad, triumphant version of Siegfried's theme is where we begin this excerpt, and it's followed by three additional musical ideas. The Valkyrie theme, representing Brunhilde, a new motif associated with freedom, and Brunhilde's theme with that distinctive turn. I'll show you each of them as we go. We begin with Siegfried's horn call. Brunhilde. just feel that passion and triumph. Well, after Siegfried and Brunhilde say their farewell, Wagner introduces a new playful version of the horn call as Siegfried sets off on a journey along the Rhine in search of adventure.
after a glorious reprise of the Rhine music, we're launched without warning into some very aggressive music describing Hagen, the main villain of the Twilight of the Gods. Then we move to a scene featuring Siegfried and the Rhine Maidens, who are still itching for the return of their gold that was stolen way back in the first scene of the Rhine Gold. Now, these ladies have a few motifs, but this one, played by three clarinets representing the three Rhine Maidens, plays the biggest role in this scene. final act, our hero Siegfried ultimately meets his tragic end as he's stabbed in the back by Hagen. To accompany his moonlit funeral procession, Wagner uses both of Siegfried's themes, the epic theme in minor and the broad horn call in major, to create a farewell worthy of one of the greatest heroes in all opera. say Wagnerian, that's what we mean. <laughs> and so we come to the final scene of the ring cycle, the immolation scene, in which Brunhilde sacrifices herself to return the ring to the Rhine Maidens and save all humanity in the process. In these final minutes, Wagner creates an astonishing symphonic tapestry of themes from the preceding 15 hours to wrap up his story. For example, listen to the moment when the Rhine Maidens finally recover the ring. Wagner takes two themes from the Rhine Gold, the Rhine Maidens lilting music from scene one, and the god's noble Valhalla theme from scene two. And then combines those two with a beautiful third theme known as redemption by love. So Wagner describes, all within one musical texture, the Rhine Maiden's joy at finally having their gold back, the resignation of the gods that their reign has come to an end, and the redemption of the world by love. Here's what they sound like all together, beginning with the Rhine Maidens. Aha. 
Paula. Rhine Maidens and Redemption by Love. Valhalla. Rhine Maidens. Redemption by Love. There are literally dozens of leitmotifs and plot points we haven't even touched upon. But more important than having a complete catalog of musical themes or a chronological synopsis at your mental beck and call is understanding how viscerally Wagner was trying to tell his story on an instinctive gut level through music alone. And that is the genius of The Ring. One final note before intermission. I mentioned that the arranger of this symphonic synthesis, Lauren Mazel, was one of my mentors. He sadly passed away back in 2014, but I reached out to his widow a few months back to let her know we were giving these performances this weekend. Well, about a month ago, I received a package in the mail with the following note. Dear Brett, have a wonderful concert with the maestro's spirit hovering over you. Many warm wishes, Deep Linda. And enclosed with the note was one of Maestro Mazel's last batons. And it'll be a special treat to get to celebrate this weekend's performances of Maestro's arrangement of the ring with a bit of Maestro himself here with us. After intermission, we proudly present the ring without words. Thank you.